Good evening. You're either watching or listening to Redwood Walk. I'm with David Frank. My name is Eric Kirk. We are talking national political news of the day, and we're going to start by following up on the results. We've talked a lot about the presidency, but we're going to talk about Congress now. Uh, Senate, um, the Republicans, we knew uh, as uh, almost immediately that the Republicans had taken the Senate. <clears throat> the Democrats actually have uh, picked up on a, a bunch of close races, including in Michigan and Wisconsin. Paul Gallego appears to have won, and they've appeared to have won in Nevada as well. So I believe the total number will be 53 uh, Republican senators to 47 Democrats, uh, setting up some possibilities in, in uh, 2026, but we'll discuss that another time. It's definitely going to be control of, of the Senate and other than filibusters, which may or may not survive this uh, term, um, the, the Democrats really have no way to slow the number of judges being appointed. They do have power until January and they are uh, making uh, preparations to jam through about 20 to 25 additional judge uh, nominations of Biden's and then that will be it. Um, the House, as of today, was called uh, for the Republicans. Um, they have uh, 218 confirmed wins in the House, which is enough to um, the Democrats uh, were at 2007 a few hours ago when then a race in Southern California was just called for uh, the Democrats. So they have 2008. Um, the way I count it with the remaining is I, I think that the um, Democrats have a good chance of winning five, will most likely win at least five of those. The Republicans will win about three. And um, and there's two that are just two up in the air. Um, the de there are two races, uh, House races in California where the Democrats are slightly behind, but we're at the phase of the counting that tends to favor Democrats. So it just all depends in, in those two races. Um, so at the end of the day, it looks like it's going to be um, Two, uh, 221 to 213 with two undecided. Could be as much as um, 215 for the Democrats or 223 for the Republicans. Either way, it's pretty close. Could be could change um, in in a um, in in the next um, in the midterm election. And if Democrats come up with 2015, it wouldn't take a whole lot of special election. Uh, wins to uh, for for the um, Democrats to take the House even before then always a possibility um, as we'll discuss in the second um, segment uh, the um, the uh, Trump is uh, basically calling a, a number of House members into the um, White House to be in the cabinet although they seem to be pretty safe Republican seats we'll discuss that when we get to that but um, but it looks like full control, just like in 2017, full control of all of the um, branches of government in the hands of Republicans. We'll see what they can do. Um, they don't have many excuses at this point. Um, and um, it does look like Trump is trying to bypass the Senate hearings for some appointments. He wants to try to do recess appointments and the like. But we can talk about that. There are a number of um, angles we can approach this, but I think the House, uh, um, well, not switching to the Republicans, being uh, remaining in Republican hands um, is, I think, the big news of the day. Well, thank you for that setup, as always, Eric. And I'm, uh, I think that pretty much everything that you said I uh, have heard before, read, agree with. Um, I'll just point out that, you know, back just to take a half step back, um, that w on election night, the Republicans were looking to pick up 27 seats that were competitive, um, like leaning a little Democrat, leaning a little Republican, or just outright competitive. The Democrats needed 43. Um, as of now, the Republicans, um, according to the New York Times, they have 26 of those. But, uh, you know, like you said, another one of those races has been, uh, at least I think the AP has called it. Um, so so that, that means that they did reach that threshold of control to uh, 18, as you mentioned. They're ahead in another four of those seats. Um, so it, like it does, it does look like they're going to end up with about 222. Um, and that that gives them a little bit of leeway. So 
rather than kind of, uh, you know, talk a little bit about is that is that certain there's going to be some recounts? Um, it, it looks pretty solid. So um, like you mentioned, they're going to be uh, as of now, three members of Congress, three members of the House rather have been uh, tentatively you know, put forward by President elect Trump um, to have seats. So so Matt Gates uh, and Michael Walls of Florida and also Elise Stefanik of New York. So that's three of those people that will then, you know, almost immediately those seats will almost immediately be vacant. So, if, uh, you know, if they do get that three cushion, then it'll be a little bit easier to imagine a scenario where the leadership um, approves and allows to move forward with those people. Uh, Matt Gates has already stepped down from, for example, from his seat. We're going to talk a little bit more about those appointments down the road. Yeah, I real, think it, real quickly, yeah, we will talk about that. But does he step down for right now as a, immediately or in January? Because uh, Trump isn't president yet. Right. So um, the article that I read said he gave notice that he t intends to step down. Okay. So so it's not formal. It's not effective immediately. Right. Um, yeah. But that's that's to become attorney general, which we'll get to. But that's the most controversial, I think, so far of all these tentative uh, uh, appointments. Which is saying uh, something, but we'll get to that. Yes, definitely. And so I think it's interesting now to speak to, um, you know, not to pivot immediately away from that horse race aspect of it, but now we're talking about leadership. So um, if, you know, assuming that um, uh, Mike Johnson does hold on to his speakership, that's that's. I think there's like a, a formality that's supposed to occur tomorrow, but a lot of the sort of jockeying has already happened today. You know, incredible news day. Um, there's, we're, the dust still has to settle, but there was a little bit of a schism that was going on within the Republican leadership in the House. And so that Matt Gates wing, like people have called it, the, you know, the MAGA wing, the folks that are, that are sort of the uh, more... Um, divisive within the Republican caucus in the House, um, they had in the past uh, had a rule put forward that said that it would take just one Congress member to mm -hmm. call for a motion to vacate, to to leave the leader, have the leadership um, uh, be forced to step down and vote for a new leader. That has been a contentious issue within their caucus um, all the way up to and including today. And so they there was a, a large contingent within the House Republicans who are saying, look, we have to be unified. Like, we we can't be the weak link here if Trump has taken the election like he has. Uh, the the Senate is now Republican, and, and you know, the House presumably is going to stay Republican. The Supreme Court is Republican. Um, the, the House, uh, the majority of the Republicans in the House just did not want to be perceived as somehow um, not unified, out of harmony. Um, so, so I would call that, you know, there was a conflict brewing. Um, and so there are a lot of rules. The point here is that a lot of rules were being stacked up as potentially um, going to be unleashed to take away the power of people by saying if you vote against, uh, for example, the party is trying to move a bill forward. If you if you obstruct moving a bill through the House, then you will be removed from your committees. Um, and they, there's a whole bunch of these rules. Many of them are private, but they, they were. Uh, poised to be released in the coming, say, 24, 48 hours, um, the discharge petition, it's called, to move things out of the committees and into the into the main body. Um, also, other rules just about governing on the floor. Um, they wanted to make it harder to even um, to in any way disagree with the leadership and how they manage uh, the House. And so I, I know I'm belaboring this a little bit, but the bottom line is that in exchange for um, some degree of uh, uh, leeway and saying, OK, look, it's not going to be just one Congress member that could that could really take down the speaker. Um, we'll we'll agree to raise that. I think they said nine that the tentative threshold is nine members of the House instead of one. So so the sort of again, the Matt Gates wing of the party. Uh, I'm not sure that, that they officially call themselves that the MAGA wing, whatever those you know, Freedom Caucus folks. Um, they they just they determined that um, in exchange for that, they would accept take away all these threatening rules. So so this this like whole suite of rules that was going to be designed to really have a basically make it so that anything that comes from the White House that the speaker approves of will basically get rubber stamped all the way through the house. They took they took those rules away tentatively 
in exchange for that, uh, Mike Johnson didn't he, he was approved unanimously as their next leader. So there's going to we'll see how this plays out. But I think that was, that's one of the big uh, news items that I saw today with House leadership, like making peace uh, with uh, with with its uh, different wings within the within the caucus. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I think it would be a mistake for them to replace Mike Johnson at the moment. They might end up doing it later if if he gets in the way, but he was completely, uh, I, I mean, he, he's, he's gone all out, um, mega. He showed up at the trial, um, in, in New York city to, um, to, to slam that he's, he is not, uh, other than passing some bills and muscling a few things through compromise bills. I, he, he hasn't really bucked, um, the tide much. So he should, he should be pretty safe. I do want to come back to a few of the races, a few of the races that are still pending real quickly um, in California. It looks like there are four races still pending and um, and the, the Democrats are ahead in two of them um, and the Republicans are, are ahead in, in the other two. But I want to say that, uh, for instance, uh, John Duarte, who is the incumbent uh, against Adam Gray, the difference is about four thousand with only 74% of the votes coming in. And again, we're at the phase where that favors Democrats, um, that all of the late early votes being counted. The other one is Michelle Steele, um, literally about 300 uh, uh, ahead of Derek Tron uh, with 93% of the votes in. So still quite a few thousands of votes um, for him to possibly catch up. Those are are two possibilities. The other two, the Democrats are ahead by like four percentage points. And I, I, barring some statistical anomaly, I don't see them catching up. So at least two to two, possibly uh, two more pickups for the, the Democrats. Um, in Oregon, uh, there's a district that is a kind of mixed. It extends the, from the southern um, suburbs of Portland down into a rural area. Um, and uh, this appears to be going towards a flip uh, because um, Janelle By Burnham is set to defeat Lori Chavez de Raymer. And um, so that'll be a gain for the Democrats. However, um, the Arizona District 6 looks like it's probably going to go Republican. Uh, Iowa I can't tell. It's just too close to call. It's like 800 votes. Uh, that the Democrat is behind, but um, and that would be a Democratic pickup. Um, Ohio, Marcy Kaptur is barely ahead, but I have a lot of faith in faith in her. She has won a lot of t tough elections. It's never been an easy one for her, and she's been there for, since forever. Um, the main district too, it's it's hard. The Democrat pulled ahead. Looks like is going to stay in power. The one really kind of depressing uh, one is that Mary Peltola, a uh, native uh, person who won partly because of the ranked choice voting system last time around. It just doesn't look, it, it still hasn't been called, but it just doesn't look like she can pick up 10,000 votes with 9% of the vote left. I Maybe I'll be proven wrong, I don't know. Um, but uh, but it does look like um, she's gone down defeat. So I, again, I, I think it looks like um, <clears throat> very likely um, yeah, in the low 220s for the Republicans and in the low to mid uh, teens uh, for the for the Democrats. And this is really important because every vote counts. There are going to be a lot of uh, Republicans in swing districts that are, might want to be careful about how they vote. Some of them already lost uh, this time around. I, I mean, the Democrats have a number of of um, of pickups, three in New York. Uh, one in Alabama and one in Louisiana uh, because of the un-gerrymandering of the court decision, and at least one in California, possibly two or three. Um, and uh, But unfortunately, the Democrats lost uh, uh, seats in Pennsylvania, one in Michigan at least, and a couple of others. It's hard for me to read the New York Times map because they don't uh, mark it as a flip if um, if if it's if there's a different boundary line, so um, so you know with all that, I, 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 and um, the uh, Marie, uh, I'm forgetting her middle name. It's a complicated pronounced one uh, with a G. Um, Perez in Southwest Washington is is way ahead, and uh, another show I want to talk about her as being 
the ticket for uh, Democrats reclaiming majority, a solid majority. So that's Gluson camp. Thank you, Gluson camp. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, I, I just want to mention too. You you talked about um, the main seat. Um, it's so close. It's it. I think that that's going to be one of those that ends up going to um, the rank choice voting. So mm -hmm. so so that I, I think I saw that that's already been declared that that's going to kick off because it's too close. But there's only uh, a very very small number of votes um, that are that would be distributed. Um, but still, it ends up that um, it's it's a 700 vote. Uh, difference and about 1200 votes might get reallocated. Um, right. So so that's it's it would have to go significantly like, you know, 65, 35 or something in order for that to change, um, which probably isn't the case. So so Maine looks like it w it may end up going that way. Also, I think um, Alaska, if I remember correctly, Alaska is ranked choice voting too, but it's just that it's so many votes. It would you, you um, Peltola would need to pick up nearly all of those votes, which is obviously yeah. impossible. So that's that's a big loss um, for Democrats there in Alaska. Speaking of that, um, Trump has already at uh, light speed announcing his uh, appointments, um, and it it uh, it some of the choices are mind boggling. Of course, <laughs> we've already talked about uh, the first one, Matt Gates uh, as Secretary of State. There had been rumors yesterday that Marco Rubio was going to be chosen. Um, I think there's a number of reasons. That that probably didn't come true um, among them because they don't want to open up too many opportunities for Democrats in um, in 2026. I I mean Florida has been really good for Republicans, but it just takes a bad two years to turn a, a lot around. So maybe they don't want to do that. Um, and then we've got uh, we have mostly people who are in Congress or or have been in Washington. But we have, um, as Commerce Secretary, Linda McMahon, who uh, is, uh, was the um, female half of um, the um, couple that owned uh, Worldwide Wrestling. I think it's called something else now, Hulk Hogan and everybody uh, for years, um, and um, it, it, some other corporate people um, that I would say are, are defined by the swamp, but they're probably going to call them outsiders. Um, it, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how this goes. Fox News uh, host is going to be Secretary of Defense. Uh, that's about the closest thing to an outsider, kind of, that I've seen. Um, there's some other, oh, uh, and there's a possible role for RFK Jr. Nothing's been confirmed, but they uh, said that he was uh, Trump um, before the election said that uh, there was some hint um, that he was going to be appointed in some sort of health capacity um, and with the FDA and the rest, but they're not really being specific. He's kind of making up titles. He's even made up a new department, the Department of Efficiency, that's going to be co-run by um, uh, Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, that, uh, I, I mean, nothing says efficiency more than creating a new layer of government and putting two <laughs> people in charge, right? So it, it, it's it's kind of surreal. Um, anything that sticks out to you, Dave? Well, there's a few, but um, before I dive into my uh, observations, I just wanted to ask you, I, I, I mean, I was listening, but I wasn't 100% clear what your comments were about Marco Rubio. Um, I thought I saw that he was actually put forward as the Secretary of State. Um, did you say something different than that? 
Yes, no, Matt Gates, uh, according to um, uh, whatever news site I'm on, is uh, CBS News is going to be Secretary of State, according to that. So, but the uh, New York Times had been reporting that it, it was going to be Marco Rubio. So, um, we'll we'll so figure it out. We'll look at the news and we'll see we'll see which is actually uh, you know uh, got traction. My understanding is Matt Gates was put forward as the Attorney General, actually. Okay. Yeah, right. so that's the last that I saw. And right before he was put forward, um, he said that um, he, he tweeted something like, um, you know, the weaponization of the Justice Department is, you know, uh, it's gone far beyond what the law will allow. And we're either going to get the government back on our side. This is a quote from Gates. We will either get the government back on our side or we will defund and get rid of it. Abolish the FBI, the CDC, the ATF, the DOJ, every last one of them if they don't come to heel. Um, so that was actually, well, he said that, yeah. So 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 it's interesting times. Um, they could end up firing people because they are hoping to get help from Congress to basically revoke the progressive era civil um, service uh, protections to allow them to make you know, thousands, tens of thousands um, at will um, employees. So if they can, if they can accomplish that, they can clean it out. If they can't, um, then yeah, defunding. Well, that'll be interesting. Um, that'll also be very cha chaotic. But um, I, I certainly didn't see ICE on that list. Right. Uh, separate. That'll go under Christy Nome. Uh, who was put forward as the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, a uh, massive uh, part of the government. Uh, form, you know, she's governor of South Dakota. And uh, while she's got very li little experience uh, with this with this subject, uh, you know, this area of policy, it appears that, uh, and I think more generally speaking, people that have stuck with Trump and have been loyalists for Trump are being rewarded in these early yeah. rounds of of uh, being proposed as the nominee, the Senate is supposed to approve most of these nominations. So the ink isn't dry on any of this stuff because really it comes down to um, the institution of the Senate um, really typically is very reflective when it comes to comes to appointments. They actually do block people from time to time, even, even when it's within their own party and their own president uh, expresses a priority. Sorry, which is why he wants to bypass that by doing them all as recess appointments. Exactly. Um, not want to have a big discussion about some of these people because the media is is, is going to make it very difficult for senators who are, are in competitive states to, to uh, just rubber stamp them. Yeah, I mean, there is so much here in this topic for us today. We're just going to scratch the surface. But um, one of the um, – with regard to what you just said about recess appointments, um, it's been reported that John Thune was was in pretty close running with uh, John Cornyn from Texas and uh, for head of the Senate, for the Senate majority leader. And John Thune um, decided he was going to tie himself to Trump as closely as possible and, uh, you know, you fill in your adjective here, but uh, the idea is that he would um, follow Trump's lead. And, and you know, the rumor out there, I guess Politico reported, uh, among, amongst other places, that uh, that Thune has agreed to recess appointments. Now, that's that that would be shocking if he actually did that because mm -hmm. it almost signs away the, you know, one of the key powers, checks and balances that's inherent in the Senate. But anyway, that's that might be a way that some of these more controversial um, and, and and quite frankly, shocking uh, uh, nominations are starting to play out. So so Matt Gates, who really didn't even practice law as a lawyer, so being the head of the Justice Department, that you know that's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. The threats to the institutions uh, compounded his own criminality compounded. Um, I want to pivot real quickly before I go into the one thing that I think is the most controversial. I'm going to pivot to real quickly. Elon Musk, you mentioned that, uh, you know, the uh, office of, um, you know, government, what is it called? Um, efficiency. The Depart Department, Department, Department of, of Government, government efficiency. efficiency. Yeah, the Doge. So similar to the Doge coin, the cryptocurrency that Elon Musk uh, so surrounded himself with. Now his, he's going to be in charge of this new um, entity, the Doge, the Department of Governmental Efficiency. Um, what they're reporting is that it's not actually going to be part of the government. It's going to be a non-governmental commission. 
um, kind of like the Social Security Commission that was put together to review Social Security, try to make it solvent. There's a lot to unpack there, but basically they, they've promised to try to cut $2 trillion out of the annual budget. You could get rid of the entire government, every employee, the entire military, and you still won't get $2 trillion. Um, so we are in a situation where, you know, Truthfully, people do need to pay attention to it, and I'm glad there's such a thing being proposed, but this all just seems so cartoonish or surreal. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. I just want to confirm, uh, CBS had a typo. Uh, Secret Marco Rubio is being nominated for Secretary of State. That's cool. Thanks for looking it up so quickly, just because I, I was like, wait, I, I think I heard you right, but I'm not 100% sure that I did. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, go ahead. And, and uh, you know, the other... When we need to discuss, well, there's, of course, um, uh, Christy Nome is going to be the, what is it, the Department of the Interior? Um, Department of Homeland Security. Yes, um, yes. You know, I mean, hey, she proved it with her dog, right? You know, so <laughs> it's, uh, I, I also think that she earned some type of spot in that rally where she had to, like, s keep a straight face and, and play through it as if, you know, everything was normal when Trump started swaying for 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, she she did her, she put her time in right then and there. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying, kind of high level. The big picture is that it's, you know, Trump surrounding himself with loyalists. Um, but but I do. So the one you had said, did anything stand out to me? And the Secretary of Defense, uh, Pete uh, Hegseth, that they're yeah. that they're putting forward, um, you know, he was the head of he, he's known for being a veterans uh, issues advocate. So he was, for example, um, CEO of Concerned Veterans for America, which is a Koch funded organization. Um, he uh, was in charge of, um, um, you know, the um, the Department of Veterans Affairs. He was originally intended to be put in charge of the Department of Veterans Affairs during the first Trump administration, but that was blocked. Uh, he's he's also a you know mostly known for being a Fox News contributor. Um, yeah. So why is he so controversial? Well, one is he wants to end the war in Ukraine, but that's not so out of the ordinary for some of Trump's supporters, people that surround him. He's got a Princeton and Harvard uh, you know uh, education experience. He got his master's in Harvard at the Kennedy School, although he said he sent it back because he disagrees with how. Harvard runs things, um, but he is a combat uh, a veteran. He's got experience in foreign wars and he's got a strong anti-establishment streak. So far, so good. That all seems pretty much uh, on brand for Trump. But I think that the one thing that stood out to me is um, I saw him speak in Israel and he talked about, uh, you know, going to uh, various places in Israel and the West Bank and saying you have to come here and you have to walk the walk the walk. And this is Israel. So the West Bank is actually considered part of the Palestinian Authority right now. And so that's a highly controversial position for the D Secretary of Defense. But moreover, he gave a big speech where he said that, you know, Israel is a collection of miracles. The Balfour Declaration, the 1917, where England kind of established Israel as an existing state. Um, when Israel was founded, uh, 48, he said that was a miracle. Um, the war, the response, the success in the war of 67, he said that's a miracle. And he said there's going to be more miracles. And that includes um, the reestablishment of the temple on the Temple Mount, fulfillment of the biblical prophecy, uh, which, you know, when you add up saying that the West Bank is part of Israeli sovereignty, and that the Temple Mount, you know, that e e to even hint at like revelation and end times, um, yeah. this is our this is our secretary. This could be our secretary of defense and is way definitely worth watching, knowing for folks that don't know that the Temple Mount is on the same land as or was on the same land as the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And that the special, you know, sort of role that the name Al-Aqsa plays in Palestinian resistance to Israel, it's it's just it, you know, that when you combine that with the fact that Mike Huckabee was nominated as the ambassador, ambassador to Israel, to Israel yeah. it, it really, you know, it really plays to that sort of Christian fundamentalism, you know, biblical prophecy. Uh, 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 I don't want to call it a risk or a threat, but let's just be aware that this is the lane that Trump is intentionally turning the ship towards the, the ship of state of the United States. Uh, these are these are you know if if personnel is is going to be any indication um, that then you know these are the types of 
uh, people Trump's intentionally surrounding himself with. I, I, I do think that there'll be pushback in Israel. I don't think even Netanyahu would want to push the temple uh, rebuilding. I, I don't know that it's been in his agenda, but that's just going to, I mean, that would just lead to violence all over the place if they were to tear down that mosque. Um, I, yeah, let me just say but, one thing and compliment to that, um, you know, in, to to speak to your point, um, the, the, some of the members like Ben Gavir and some of the other members of, of uh, Netanyahu's administration, um, they have expressed that, well, first we have to take back control because right now um, Israel doesn't control that space formally. Yeah. So so it's incrementalism towards uh, speaking to a constituency of of, you know, pretty far to the right conservatism within Israel. Right. Um, I, and, and yeah, the Huckabee choice is just uh, mind boggling. Interesting that his daughter is not um, back in, in the cabinet, but maybe she wants to stay governor of Arkansas. Um, you know, we'll see. Um, I, the other one is Tulsi Gabbard as uh, director of national intelligence. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, so for folks who don't know, she was in the National Guard. She's a veteran. She was in Iraq uh, as a soldier. She came back and ran for Congress from Hawaii. She was a Democrat, but she switched parties. This would put her in charge of a $70 billion uh, a year budget for the, you know, the CIA's uh, the sorry, the intelligence community spying network. She is opposed to U.S. intervention in Ukraine and the Middle East, uh, but although specifically Syria, I think she's a little quieter when it comes to uh, you know supporting Israel as an ally. Although I don't think there's anybody in Washington who's against that for the most part. Um, she also uh, thought she she people say that she's uh, uh, sort of an apologist for Putin and and uh, and Russia more generally. Um, saying that the we could have the, the West could have avoided the conflict in Ukraine if we were more uh, aligned um, with the uh, you know not promoting the idea that Ukraine could eventually become part of NATO, um, and she actually was involved in some misinformation spreading when it came to a U.S. funded uh, bioweapons lab within Ukraine. So the right. she'll, she'll be in charge of a community. Uh, that is going to strongly resist her presence there. Highly contentious uh, appointment, uh, particularly under the circumstances these days. There could, there could be some mass resignations there, uh, yeah, which will be very interesting um, and po potentially dangerous for national security. Um, Absolutely. There, you know what's going to happen. Real quickly, Zeldin as um, EPA administrator. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, he, you know. yeah, this is one of the ones where he's on he's on the record of saying that he would love to kind of deregulate the yeah. the the uh, environmental legal system that we have in our country, take away some of the power of the uh, administration or the agency to even regulate. You know, uh, this is obviously going to be massively controversial to a lot of people, but uh, I think within the or the Trump orbit, uh, within the you know business community, uh, the idea that somebody is going to be in charge of intentionally weakening. Uh, the EPA, that's that's going to be pretty probably in the corporate community pretty well received, although it's, again, highly controversial. segment um you know we whenever this happens which is often democrats lose elections in a big way there's always the recrimination the um the discussion afterwards about what the democrats did wrong and um 
and who's to blame and what you, we can do to avoid this in the future. And it seems like a lot of the same mistakes of 2016 were made. Uh, quite frankly, a lot of the same mistakes that uh, were made in 1984 and 1988. And, uh, and you know, just they, they doesn't seem to, to learn. Um, there are there are the the uh, accusations coming from what we would call the corporate what the left would call the corporate de Democrats the the moderates and centrists that um, that wokeism and and uh, pronoun the emphasis on pronouns and words and and the cu culture wars that we can't win are what are uh, making it difficult for Democrats to win because even members of the marginalized groups don't even approve of those terms, you know, such as Latinx, for instance, overwhelmingly rejected uh, uh, by by Latinos. I want to point out that it did come from a group of Latinos, um, you know, and, but still, it's uh, it was it's not something that you know, white America is pushing on them. But it's still it's just not a um, uh, an issue there, the, and and also the um, well, the, the other accusations that you know the Democrats were too passive in trying to um, shut or shut down or at least verbally respond to the demonstrations in um, uh, on the campuses that they can't they were perceived as being part of the Democratic Party and uh, and completely alienated most of America, and so that that's coming from the center. Uh, the criticism from the left is that she was winning when she had a populist message, and then all of a sudden, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and and uh, Mark Cuban, and and um, her um, uh, Harris's brother-in-law, I'm forgetting his name at the moment, all got in there and just blanded out the message, uh, center it, made it made it more centrist, and uh, and the same lost for the same reasons that um, Hillary Clinton lost, or some of them anyway. And, um, and 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 failure to be specific in 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 the policies. Um, I do have to say that her economic policy was 80 pages long. I think it was one of the most detailed I've ever seen in a presidential race. But the media wasn't covering it. Nobody was discussing her 80 page plan, right? I mean, so she needed to be specific in her speeches when she failed to. When she was asked what she would do for different from Biden, she said, uh, I can't think of anything. And then, you know, it, it, she was trying to uh, send uh, dog whistle signals to uh, Democrats about what she may or may not do about Gaza, saying that she hears them, that um, that she that that the suffering is unconscionable. But people didn't. But, you know, the and, and the left would argue that she needed to make clear what she was going to do. And, and especially what she was going to do that was different from Biden. Was she going to actually put pressure, not ask, but put pressure on Netanyahu to stop right up into an, an embargo, if not? So, um, you know, and it could be that all of those things are partly right. Uh, it could be that she spent a lot of money on so glitzy celebrity stuff, you know, with um, I, I, it come out that she paid Oprah Winfrey something. I can't or some ridiculous amount. A million. A million to to you know host the thing, um, and um, and and she had a billion dollars she raised and she's out of money now. She's actually in hawk and uh, and that's being used against her. And so she spent all the money, and um, just wasn't getting out. Now I'll, I'm going to pass it off to you in just a sec, but I want to point out one last thing before we criticize her campaign too much. Realize that she outperformed she in in the seven states that the battleground states she did better in those states that underperformed less in those states than she did in all the other states including blue states by the way so i think we have to talk about the power of the right-wing media versus all the rest of the media it just is too big the 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 analysis is that when she had her own PR programs going on and constantly responding in those seven states, she was able to counter some of it. But everywhere else, you just have the right wing media that is just a juggernaut. Um, a lot to talk about, um, yeah. but Dave, I'm going to let you might have other things to add. Yeah, I mean, we're so, you know, we're just a week out. It's Wednesday, right? So we're just a week out. A lot of the 
analysis is still to be done there. I think there was the first wave, the the you know denial, the second wave, the acceptance where we're going to hit to the third wave, whatever that actually ends up being. I'm not familiar with the psychology of it all, but uh, the truth is that there's there's one there, there are, you know, you can look at it from an e economic perspective. You could look at it from a cultural perspective. You could look at it strategically and there's there's a lot to be said for each. But the big picture, like I've talked about before, is that, um, you know, Democrats in particular, um, Harris, lost ground in 90% of all the counties in America and across nearly all demographic groups. Um, so that implies that not any single strategic mistake is the culprit. So, you know, like I said, we'll we'll hear more about uh, w abandoning working class values. Like Bernie Sanders said, you know, mm -hmm. the Democratic Party has not is not speaking to real concerns kitchen table policy, you know, economic issues. 75% of the people in exit polls said that they are either, you know, somewhat or very under economic distress. That's not that's not good um, that, you know, that's affecting their lives. Meanwhile, you compare that to the donor class, right? The donor class, people are saying from an economic perspective that, you know, billionaires and other people that are activists with deep pockets, corporate interests, etc really are preventing the Democratic Party from promoting policies that improve people's lives. A lot to be said for that. Uh, but I do want to point out something that I think is very underreported. New York Times ran a story about a month ago now about an organization called Future Forward. Future Forward, um, they claim that they're going to run that they were going to run a money ball approach so if you're not familiar with the film Moneyball, it's when you use data analytics to identify exactly the traits that you need and Moneyball refers to baseball but the idea is that with you can maximize every dollar that you spend to get the like best possible outcome so they were really data analytics driven flooding the zone with money in the battleground states. They raised over $700 million that they deployed. That's more than the Biden, sorry, that's more than the Harris campaign and the Trump campaign combined. Um, so so these super PACs that spent on behalf of candidates, we talk about how it's a, a you know, $2 billion election. This one Democratic uh, super PAC uh, really did kind of under the radar, uh, take, you know, significant, have a significant impact on the uh, on the outcome and what you had spoken to, which is in these battleground states um, that that those large swings, you know, every like I've described every county having a little red arrow shifting to the right. Um, those arrows were smaller in these battleground states and in these targeted races where they did deploy their money. So strategically speaking, they were forcing the campaign to stay on message. And and instead of having a story, instead of having a narrative, instead of engaging with people, they were tightly focused on specific messaging, like again, flooding the zone. So I think that that work, you know, when the forensics come to bear, part of the problem is, is not going to be that Harris did anything strategically wrong. It's going to be more philosophical that it wasn't the, the you know, choosing the wrong vice president. It wasn't, um, you know, not having an open primary or, or you know, or or uh, embracing a shift to the right to include Liz Cheney. Um, it wasn't necessarily shifting to make your priorities the border or immigration to try to, you know, kind of outright flank the Republicans. Those are those were small strategic decisions. But but at the end of the day, they lost everywhere. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I could, I'll pass over to you. I mean, there's a couple other things I know. I'll, I, right. I think I'll culturally, I think you, you, you've picked up on the cultural reasons. And I think that that, that kind of dovetails with my, you know, uh, kind of imp my, my uh, diagnosis that that's really the path for the future is to figure out how to engage the narrative, how to engage people that you, you get it. And, and I've described it as meeting them where they are. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a number of criticisms of his VP pick, her, pardon me, her VP pick. I actually still think that that was provided her the best chance of winning. Had she picked Shapiro, maybe she would have picked up Pennsylvania, but that's it. It wouldn't have helped her anywhere else. Um, and um, not not even in Michigan and Wisconsin. She, she picked, I think, the best VP for it. That was not a problem. I think if I was to criticize her strategy. I would say the whole thing of, about joy and and denial um, is, 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 pardon me, is, it was kind of a denial of where people are at. When you're, ta you can say, talk about how the economy is healthy, but if people are still paying more money and, and, and not, and, and their wages haven't caught up, 
um, they're just not going to be happy and they're not going to be ha happy with you and you sound tone deaf. I think that's probably about the biggest um, uh, mistake that she should have made. She should have, you know, again, stuck to the populism. And what actually made her pull up in the polls was she almost had people convinced that she was the outsider. She was running yeah. against the incumbency. And when she started to uh, get move away from that message from um, that one, she that that's where she slipped late September. Um, and um, and so but, you know, again, this was structured against her. This this race was structured against her. I don't know that she there was anything she could do ultimately to win the race, because even when she was ahead in the polls, it looks like there were still a lot of people that the pollsters were not able to account for in their polls. And they just need to give up. I think, you know, next time around, I'm, you know, I say this every time, but but the polls were absolutely wrong. The, the Gold Star poll in Iowa, way off, like 14 points off. It, that it, that was a big one. Yeah, I mean, but miserably again. Um, and and even the right wing polls probably just got lucky, but even they didn't pick up on on some of the extent um, that that this happened. So it's just now. Granted, polls are snapshots and and all of that, and a lot of people didn't come out to to uh, vote. But looking at the difference, though. Is uh is the difference between Biden and her is something like at this point eleven well maybe ten million down to and it'll probably be down to eight or nine million by the time the votes are are counted, but but there are a lot of people who came out to vote for him didn't switch votes necessarily because Trump is getting about what he got last time. It's there are eleven million people who didn't vote, and why not? Uh, well, there are probably a lot of um, working class. Democrats who could not get bring themselves to vote for Trump, but just couldn't bring themselves to vote anywhere. I'll be looking forward to seeing how many um, ballots were cast, for instance, in Michigan that had nobody for the top ticket. Uh, there was like 80,000 of them in 2016 setting a, a record. That's people who did not vote for any candidate for president. Um, and so, um, I mean, these are... Uh, th so, uh, yeah, the, the Democrats really need to I, mean, I almost think they need to just burn it down um, mm -hmm. and start over, start from scratch. And they need to know that they cannot win if, with with the third way of politics. They need to abandon the Clinton thing. It won it for them in the 90s, but it has lost them the working class vote. And I, I mean, I, I believe that um, the uh, that Trump gained in every uh, at least in terms of percentages in every group, the black voters. Uh, he actually took Latino voters, at least according to the exit polls. We'll see if that actually holds up with the more involved data. Um, and uh, and did much better in the Asian vote. Not sure about the LGBTQ vote. He lost ground in, in the Jewish vote. They went from 68% um, to Biden in the exit polls to 78% Harris. Um, we can talk a lot about that. Uh, of course, uh, you know, you can there's there's several things that account for it. One is that, well, it's because she supports genocide in Gaza from some of the more anti-Semitic elements of the left to um, to they recognize creeping authoritarianism when they see it. Uh, they have a historical, uh, a, a collective uh, consciousness of that. Uh, the other group was with women. Um, that with, with um, the, the, the she did a little bit better with white women, but still lost white women um, with that. Now I have to say that the black vote is like about 85 percent, 78 percent of um, the um, uh, of, of black men voted uh, for uh, for Harris, which is very low, as opposed to 92 percent of black women, which is maybe a point or two below. What uh, what they normally are. Um, so a, a lot to uh, talk about here. Unions are saying, "Don't blame us. We tried to get our members out for her. Um, you know, we did everything we could. It just wasn't happening." Uh, we've got less than two minutes left. I'm going to let you close it out. Okay. Well, thank you. I so <clears throat> you and I talked a little bit about the exit polls last time. So I'm not going to go down to that granular level. I think we still do need to see uh, the you know the cross tabs and just get a 
a better sense. But but generally speaking, I, I agree with obviously everything that you said there. I did want to kind of throw you a bone a little bit and um, excuse me. And I and I you know appreciate that you you know last couple times we were really thoughtfully exploring the cultural uh, p uh, explanations for what happened. And um, th there's been a lot of talk. What do I mean by that? There's been a lot of talk about the Democratic Party maybe being a little bit too or a lot too focused on not just identity politics, but on like trying to shift the Overton window on norms. And so what does that mean? Like the the space where people are, are like you can speak uh, politely in public. And 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 that the, there's some a criticism that the Democratic Party is trying to take basically what amounts to whether it's cultural elites, academic elites, coastal elites, and kind of project that on the rest of the country. And there's this kind of underlying pushback of not being want to be preached to or like not have the thought police involved. And so that's a gen, that's a general feeling. I don't think Harris, you know. I, I think it's known that Harris did not engage in any of this strategically. She didn't. She didn't speak to any specific woke issues, virtue signaling, social justice issues. Um, she really did not go down that road. Which you know, people are saying, well, that seems to be the problem that we're facing. That seems to be um, you know the next step, the next frontier to uh, to address. And we'll talk more about that in the future. Um, I think I think it's a very nuanced topic and, and it deserves a further discussion. Eeny, beeny, chili beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. OK. All right, you ready? Yes. That brings us to predictions. Uh, Dave, what do you have? Um, so I want to kind of pick up where I left off last week. And last week I, I thought that uh, we were going to see Donald Trump put forward some some big names, some standard names, some relatively popular names when it comes to staffing his cabinet. But in fact, really Marco Rubio, which I did predict uh, last week for Secretary of State, that was the only one I got right. In fact, he's not going with the names, the big names. He's He's got a clear signaling agenda. And um, I think that that's a, that's on brand. What we've learned, what we've talked about is that Democrats lost everywhere. And so my prediction is that when they when the dust settles, they're going to realize that a return to their core values, Democratic core values, that's going to be the big thing. Um, FDR's second Bill of Rights included America. Every American has a right to a job, an adequate wage and decent living, a decent home, medical care, economic protection during sickness, accident, old age, or unemployment, and a good education. Now, it's beyond any government uh, to really transition from where we are here to there very quickly. But if you if you instill your values, if you if you base your narrative, you base your story on on working people, everyday people, leave no one behind. I think that's that's the light at the end of the tunnel for Democrats. And moreover, I think that Trump's administration, some of the things we're about to see, some of the actions, some of the policies we're about to see will make the the contrast even more stark. So even though it's always darkest here before dawn, um, I do think that there will be a light, a direction, and a path for Democrats to dig their way out revealed very, very soon. Well, I'm going to make a prediction about one of uh, Trump's promises. He's promised to deport 15 million people. First of all, that's probably impossibly logistically, um, but I don't think he's going to even try. He's got ec economists pressuring him saying, if you deport even a large number of those people, the price of food will go up. That you don't, and, and, and one of the things we have learned is that inflation is the third rail of politics at this point. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I don't think he's going to deport anywhere near as many people. He's gonna showcase, unfortunately, I think those poor Haitians in Ohio are going to get their visas re revoked and they're going to be deported. Um, a lot of deportations in Aurora uh, and the rest. And he'll do like he did, punish blue states and and, um, and, and the the rest of the time. But I don't think he's, he, I think he's going to claim um, that more people are being rounded up and deported, but they don't even have the courts to do it. And, and if they're going to get spending under control for Elon Musk, they can't even, come up with the money to be able to pay pay for that. So my 
my my prediction is that um, that promise gets fulfilled about as much as Mexico paying for the wall that's still falling apart due to graft. So um, we'll see if any of this comes true. Until next time, stay informed and stay engaged.